Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody for another week of apologetics. Uh, this week's topic is going to be the Crusades, um, which so is our second of our third of what will be will end up being three weeks on different historical topics of apologetics. Next week we'll do Galileo. That's always a fun topic. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about the Crusades here is that uh, personally, I think well, apologists differ on this. Uh, some people think the Inquisition is easier to defend than the Crusades, and some people think the Crusades easier to defend than the Inquisition. I actually think that the Crusades are a lot easier to defend. Um, that, that, that's, that's my opinion. Um, the uh, because for the Inquisition, you have to do a lot of like you know drawing particular distinctions, and you have to know a lot about the politics, and you have to know a lot about the context of the politics from the 14 and 1500s. Whereas for the Crusades, um, you can draw parallels that are a lot closer to the present day um, with regard to perceptions of national security threats and economic interests and things like this. So the number one misconception about the Crusades is what? If you had to guess, what would you what would you say? Yeah. Christians and the Muslims. Okay. Um, yes, definitely. The Crusades are wars between Christians and Muslims. What is the number one misconception, do you think? When people bring up the Crusades, oh, well, you know, the, the Crusades. Well, it's, it's probably the, the religious, but it really wasn't. It was over the territory and power. Okay. So the number one misconception is that the Crusades are primarily about trying to convert people and pr predominantly about uh, religion. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to try to uh, break both of those today. Um, while religion was certain, well, certainly religion was a factor in the Crusades, there were many factors other than just religion, and certainly the Crusades were not about trying to convert Muslims to Catholicism. Um, it was anything, it was anything but trying to convert Muslims to Catholicism. So oftentimes you'll hear, you'll hear people draw the distinction between, you'll hear, you'll hear people say, you know, Islamic Jihad, Crusades, basically the same thing. Oh. And, of course, it's not true because in, in Islamic, I guess in Islamic practice, a Jihad is a war for the express purpose of expanding the faith, whereas in Catholicism, Crusades are not that. So, what is a Crusade? Um, the consensus definition of a Crusade in amongst Catholic theologians. So I will say it's a consensus definition. The magisterium like hasn't said this is what a crusade is, and like you know there hasn't been a church council that has defined what a crusade is. There's no pope that's like issued a you know a teaching under papal infallibility saying this is what a crusade is. But the consensus definition that pretty much all theologians are agreed on right now is that it's basically um, when Christians. Take up arms <coughs> to defend people who are being oppressed and and it's approved by the papal office or a church council. So the consensus definition amongst Catholic theologians is that a crusade is when Christians take up arms for the purpose of defending people who are being oppressed, and this war is sanctioned by either the papal office or by a church council. Yes? You know, if we changed uh, the papal office and, and that to American government, it sounds like what we do all the time when we go over into down into Afghanistan okay. and all that. Yeah, perhaps. You, you could certainly draw a parallel there, right? Um, so, I mean, certainly you could sort of draw a parallel between, say, the War Powers Act from the 60s, 70s, and uh, in the 2000s to, uh, um, to the Crusades. But notice here, the emphasis is on defending people who are being oppressed. The emphasis is not on making war on somebody for the purpose of spreading the faith, which is sort of the in when the when almost a direct translation of the word crusade into Arabic is the word jihad, but it has a different connotation. The word jihad or crusade in Arabic means a war for the purpose of spreading the faith. Crusade does not mean that in the realm of Christian theology. So uh, first, let's talk about the conditions that sort of made the crusades happen. First, um, 
there was, going back to the Roman Empire, there was sort of a, let's see, I guess there's no map here, but there was sort of a, uh, a competition for control of Mesopotamia and the Arabian Peninsula between Rome and the Persians. So, um, by, let's see, so you had Rome, the whole Roman Empire against the, uh, what they called the Parthian Empire, which was contemporary Iran, sort of the Rome and the Parthians were always trying to get an advantage over who was going to control Mesopotamia and who was going to control the Arabian Peninsula and, you know, who might control Egypt or parts of eastern Turkey and the Caucasus, maybe, things like this. Well, after Rome fell, what was the successor state to the Roman Empire in the east? Anybody know? Uh, uh, Begins with a B. Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, good, okay. So, the Rome, so Rome in the west falls, Rome falls in 476, but the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, continues on until 1453. So, let's see. So basically, um, from the fall of Rome in the, in the West through maybe the rise of Islam, you have the Byzantine Empire continuing to play this game with the Persians to control Mesopotamia and the Arabian Peninsula. Now, after Rome fell in the West, the Romans sort of no longer had a resource advantage over the Persians, and they more or less had a stalemate. So um, up until maybe so maybe up until the 600s, the Byzantines and the Persians had sort of been duking it out over Mesopotamia and Arabia, and neither one of neither one of these powers, either the Persians or the Byzantines, were able really to impose themselves on Mesopotamia or the Arabian Peninsula, and this lack of one of these major empires being able to control this region created the conditions that allowed the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula to unite under Muhammad and unite behind Islam and then spread into Mesopotamia. And then after the Byzantines and the Persians had basically exhausted themselves fighting over this region, it was easy for them to move into Byzantine Middle Eastern territory like Palestine, Syria, and Egypt, as well as move into Persia. Um, because the Byzantines and the Persians sort of exhausted themselves over fighting over Mesopotamia and the Arabian Peninsula. So the sort of the stalemate, if you will, allowed the conditions for Islam to rise and then for Islam to pick up the pieces after the Byzantines and the Persians couldn't gain advantage of each other. So this is so successful that um, the uh, Muslim Caliphate under Muhammad and then Muhammad's successors um, pushed into territories that had been, well, one might say, 90% Christian for about 700 years at this point, six or 700 years. So, to the point where in 711, in 711, they crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and they invade Spain. So, forces of Muhammad's successors, if you will, under the United Caliphate at this point still, invade Spain. And Spain at this point was a Christian kingdom that had been ruled over by the Visigoths. The Visigoths had ruled Spain. They converted to Christianity about a hundred years before this. So at this point, the Visigoths had been Christian for about a century. Um, in 733, the Muslims uh, pushed through Spain and tried to invade France. And the Muslim armies from the Caliphate were defeated in 733 at the Battle of Tours by Charles Martel, or Charles the Hammer, who was the uh, grandfather of Charlemagne. So, the French began their history of, you know, victories with Charles Martel, um, 733. So after their defeat in 733, after trying to invade France, the Muslims sort of retreated back to safer territory, which was Spain, and the members of the Visigothic aristocracy and Visigothic kings that were not killed in the Battle of Guadalete in 711 by the Muslims, then fled to the northern mountainous country of Spain and began a 700-year resistance war to take back the country, which ended finally in 1492 when the Moors were expelled from the peninsula. So, yes, a 700-year resistance war. Uh, the, uh, the remnants of the Visigothic ruling class that weren't executed by the Muslims following the Battle of Guadalete in 711 fled to the hills and began a resistance war with any Christians that would follow, still follow them. Um, so that's where we get the Spanish Reconquista from. 
because uh, there's this one patch of mountainous country in Basque country. And this, is, this is one of the reasons why the Basques like always want to be separate from Spain, because the Basques say, the Ro you know, we're the only part of Spain that was never conquered. You know, the Romans wouldn't come up into our mountains, and the Muslims wouldn't come into our mountains, and you know, when uh, when the Visigoths wanted to, when the Visigothic kings like wanted to hide from the Muslims and start the resistance fighting, where did they go to? They ran to the hills of the Basque country. Um, so that's that's where it started there. So. So by the 800s, by the so let's see, by the 800s, Muslim uh, forces of the Muslim Caliphate had conquered the following territories that had previously been Christian since you know the first century, um, and I guess maybe hadn't been majority Christian since the first century, but had Christians in them since the first century, and certainly had been majority Christian since maybe the time of Constantine. So at this point, you're talking lands that had been 90% Christian for four or five hundred years. By the 800s, Muslims had conquered Palestine, which was, you know, had Jerusalem in it, and they had conquered Syria, which had Antioch, which is where Peter and Paul and St. Matthew had taught for a while. Um, they had conquered Egypt. Egypt, of course, um, had the major, major patriarchate of Alexandria. Um, which is where people like Origen of Alexandria had, had written voluminously uh, in the 200s. Um, let's see, they had conquered North Africa. This is, they had actually conquered and raised to the ground St. Augustine's hometown of Thagastia um, on the way to, um, on the way to uh, cross the of Gibraltar, right? They had conquered Spain, which had been under Visigothic Christian control for about 100 years. They had conquered um, much of Greece. In 823, they had conquered Crete, which had been Christian since, ever since, uh, one of the letters that St. Paul writes in the New Testament is to Titus, who is the bishop of Crete. So, um, Crete had been Christian since the time of St. Paul. Um, and they had, they had been conquered. Sicily itself. Sicily was conquered by uh, forces of the Muslim Caliphate in 902. So, the huge island off the coast of Italy um, was conquered in 902, and um, forces of the Muslim Caliphate um, would then use Sicily as a base for raiding the peninsula of Italy itself. Rome was sacked three times in the 8 and 900s by Islamic forces based in Sicily. Um, as a matter of fact, Pope Nicholas, called by someone, some people the Great, was known for uh, he uh, rebuilt parts of the city that had been raised to the ground by Muslim incursions. Um, part of the city walls of Rome that exist to this day are called the Leonine Walls because Pope Leo had rebuilt the walls of Rome in three years after Muslim incursions had sacked Rome and destroyed the city walls of Rome that had been around since the Caesars. So um, that's where the Leonine Wall of Rome gets its name. Pope Leo had rebuilt the walls. Um, after Muslim based in Sicily had destroyed it. Okay, so so uh, what sort of strikes you about this initially? Systematic. Okay, very systematic. What else? Persistent. Very persistent. Okay, so we have a systematic and persistent um, effort to conquer territories that had been bastions of Christianity for some time. And very quickly, you know, within maybe, you know, uh, within 200 years of the beginning of Islam, you've got major territories that have been Christian for several hundred years being conquered by Muslim invaders. Um, so one of the things that we see often, uh, people who are saying that the Crusades were not justified on Christians' behalf often make the following argument. Muslims, when they conquered territories, were very benevolent rulers after they conquered the territories. And... I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll share, and, and the two arguments people normally make is that, one, um, if they conquered your territory, um, you were not forced to convert to Islam, um, and all you had to do was put up with the fact that you couldn't practice your religion in public. Um, and that's all you had to do, and, uh, you know, some people would argue that, you know, maybe the ACLU should have been around then, um, and they would have loved this, uh, but, sorry, I had to Okay. Um, but the, the key thing here is that while that is true, um, 
the Mus uh, Muslims, when they conquered terror, forces of the Muslim Caliphate under Muhammad and Muhammad's successors, would do that, which, you know, was, you know, sort of uh, benevolent in that time period, you might say. But at the same time, they only applied that if you survived the initial hostilities. So, so basically, yes, they would allow you to continue to be a Christian and not be forced to convert to Islam if you paid higher taxes and if you didn't practice your religion in public. But they only applied that if you, the uh, vast majority of Muslim leaders only applied that after you had sur officially surrendered. So if, for example, you go to the city of Tagastia, which was leveled and raised to the ground, and all the Christians executed, um, the city of Tagastia refused to surrender. Um, and they only, and, and, and the Muslim forces like only only uh, applied this benevolent uh, treaty uh, stipulated, this, this benevolent, uh, um, you might say, uh, benevolent uh, surrender terms only after people surrendered. But there were the, were the people left. <laughs> so, um, so, yes, it is true. If you survive the initial hostilities, which most of the city of Alexandria didn't, the entire Church of North Africa, which was St. Augustine's, like, home province, didn't. Um, most of the city of Antioch did not survive. Most of the city of Nicaea did not survive. So, um, yes, it is true that if you survive the initial hostilities, which many people didn't, so the only way to get the supply to you was the Muslims had to besiege your city, and then you had to surrender the city, and then let the Muslims walk in. Right, so if you surrendered the city, then, yes, you could not be forced to convert to Islam if you agreed to surrender before the Muslims attacked, and if you agreed to pay higher taxes, and you promised not to practice your religion in public. Does anybody want to guess what the, what the punishment was for practicing Christianity in public was? Death. Yeah. Yes, death. Under, 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 Quran, under Sharia law, the punishment for evangelizing a Muslim is death, and if you're a Muslim, the punishment for converting to another religion is death. So, um, it, this is not like a civil liberties haven, not even for this, this time period. Um, so, I just wanted to address that quickly here, because uh, many people who say the Crusades were not justified will cite that. Like, look how benevolent they were. I mean, Christians during the Reconquista in Spain would like conquer the city and then tell the Jews and Christ tell the Jews and Muslims to get out. At least the Muslims allowed the Christians to stay. Amen. <laughs> yeah. in, in a grave. Yes. <laughs> you know, if, if they lived and surrendered, and also you know they could stay possibly in graves. Um, Ken. Okay. Ken. Yes. Real quick, are sure. are popes at that time like one of them you just said was Pope Leo? Yes. Survived. He was not captured and killed. Yes. Because when the, when the, when Muslims were when forces of the Muslim Caliphate were invading Italy, or when they weren't invading Italy to conquer Italy, they were mostly they would mostly invade Italian cities and abscond with their riches. Plunder. Yeah, they, they mostly like if they would sack Rome, they would okay. conquer Rome and like set up you know uh, you know a new government there. They would sack Rome, take off as many things as they could, and then go back to Sicily. Okay. Okay, and then by the eleven by the eleventh century we start to get a uh, conquest of Asia Minor. So Asia Minor, Byzant Byzantine land start to be, start to be, take, so Byz the Byzantine heartland starts to become conquered around the 11th, in the 11th century. Um, and sort of the, the beginning of the rise of the Turks. Okay, so how do we get, so this is sort of the background. So how do we get from this to the Crusades? Um, in the year 1071, the Byzantines lost a battle called the Battle of Maniskert in, wet, in what's now eastern Turkey. And in 1071, after the Battle of Maniskert, this was basically broke the back of Byzantine power. Like, at this point, the Byzantines couldn't really consistently defend their heartland, right? There would be times where the Byzantines would sort of have a surge and be able to protect at certain points, but after 1071, Everyone kind of knew that it was only a matter of time until the Byzantines finally lost everything. The Byzantines would hold on until 1453, but after 1071, after Maniskert, it's clear that the Byzantines are going to have a hard time recovering at all. 
So in 1071, the Byzantine emperor sends a message to, to the, or sorry, not in 1071, um, after 1071, the um, Byzantine emperor sends a message to Rome asking the popes if they could organize the Western Christians to relieve Constantinople and try to support the Byzantine emperor and maybe open up a second front in the Middle East so that the Byzantines were no, would be no longer bearing the brunt of Muslim attacks, or maybe, so, yes, for one of two things. One, either open up a second front with the Muslims so that they can fight the Byzantines so they have to divide their forces and, you know, some Muslim leaders would fight the Byzantines and some Muslim leaders would fight the Western Christians. Um, or he asks for them to come and put Western Christians to come to relieve B Byzantium and sort of put Western troops under the control or the support of the Byzantine generals. So that is in ten, around 1071. Anyone? Okay, so why would that be kind of interesting? What? So when did the schism occur? It's 15 years. Between, between the east and the west? 10, 10, 10. 1054. So the, west, so the schism between, the official schism between the Greek East and Latin West happened in 1054. So within 20 years of this schism, the Greek emperor is asking for the assistance of the Western Christianity to come help out the Greek church. So this also has, so the popes are then going to have a wide variety of reasons why they want to get involved in the Middle East. Okay, a couple of other things I should mention here is that... Um, Let's see, sort of uh, economic things that are also interesting. One, um, Mus or sorry, a religious thing. Muslims, uh, the Muslim rulers that conquered these territories would not allow pilgrimage by non-Muslims to holy sites that were in these areas. So, for example, if you were a Christian and you wanted to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, before when, when the Byzantines were controlling that, you were able to theoretically go from. France, or from, you go from well, Gaul or France to Jerusalem, you could make a pilgrimage. You could go to Syria, Antioch, you could go to Alexandria, you could make a pilgrimage, no longer. Right? You're not allowed to make pilgrimage if you're a Christian because Muslims would consider that what? Muslim rules consider that what? You're, you're, worship. you're yeah. expressing your faith yeah. in yeah. Public worship, worship forms of evangelization, right? Pilgrimage is not allowed. Okay. Also, um, Muslim rulers um, would also not allow trade caravans to go east on the silk on the silk road. Who does that? Whereas before, when you at least when like the Byzantines and the Persians were sort of jockeying, and there was a cold war over the Middle East in the five, six, seven hundreds, you had uh, you could have caravans take merchandise to the Byzantine border. You could have your commercial agents take it over in Constantinople and bring it to the Persian border, and then the Persians, you could pay your Persian subsidiaries to take it across the Silk Route to India and China. No longer. Okay, so there's no longer the lucrative Silk Route that is as a result of Muslim conquests in the Middle East and uh, things like that. So, um, so there's sort of a lot of different uh, things going on here. So finally, in 1095, Pope Urban II calls the Council of Claremont. Council of Claremont. And in the Council of Claremont, he, bring, he orders all the major Christian um, princes and kings to come to this council. And he urges one, them to stop fighting each other. And if they are going to be fighting somebody, um, it would be better off if they turned their martial energies to something productive, he says, like trying to defend people who are being oppressed in Muslim territory. So as long as France and England and, you know, the French and the, you know, uh, people from Flanders and as long as the various German states, as long as you guys are going to be fighting somebody, you might as well get some kind of alliance together and go and help out people who may actually need some help rather than, you know, fighting with each other for land and money and things like this. So, that's sort of what Pope Urban II said at the Council of Claremont. And this was actually very well received. As a matter of fact, Christian kingdoms 
It was pretty much unanimous at the Council of Claremont that all of the all of the princes and kings that attended thought this was an excellent idea. Unlike the Inquisition, right? We have primary sources in the Inquisition that say from the Spanish Inquisition saying Inquisition Spanish Inquisition was necessary, Spanish Inquisition was saying unnecessary, then you have to go and look at like who's making what statements. If you look at primary sources about the Crusades, virtually all of the primary sources from people writing in Europe at this time are saying, great idea. Best idea ever. Humanitarian effort. We're going, think of all those people we're going to liberate in Muslim territory. Right? So, so, and it's kind of funny, so since the 800s, the vast majority of the Christian kingdoms have been fighting defensive wars against, against uh, Muslim incursions. Well, Christians in Spain have been fighting Muslim incursions. Um, Christians in the Balkans have been fighting against Muslim incursions. Christians, well, North Africa was no longer around. Um, the Byzantine people, Christians in Asia Minor have been fighting against Muslim incursions. Christians in Italy had been fighting against Muslim incursions. Christians in the Mediterranean, there had sort of been, you know, uh, the Venetians and everything had been having, you know, naval battles against uh, various Muslim fleets in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The Muslims took Cyprus at a certain, uh, in the 900s, I think, as well. So everyone, the Council of Claremont thinks this is a great idea. Urban II, you're a genius. So this is sort of seen as a good and necessary thing in 1095. So most, the vast majority of Christian kings and princes thought this was not only a good idea that Urban has, but it was also a necessary thing. Right? Lots, like, for example, the king of France at this time said, made the fault, made, well, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but he makes this speech at the Council of Claremont where he says, We've been fighting them on our territory. Rather than fighting the Muslims on our territory, we should go and fight them on their territory. <laughs> so, um, what is that kind of? Where have we heard that argument before? It sounds, familiar. <laughs> sounds like. Yeah, you know, yeah. so, sounds a little bit like the argument some people were making about the war on terror, right? You know, yeah. Muslims try to bomb us anyway. We might as well, you know, open up a front and fight them over there, and they can bomb stuff. They can bomb us over in their territories instead of bombing us over here. Mm -hmm. So. So the, the, the king of France actually makes this very same argument, right? We're going to be fighting the Muslims anyway, you know, we've been fighting them defensively, we might as well go and take it to their territory and have them fight on their own territory for once. Okay, so when Urban finally declares the crusade and gets everyone to sign up for it, um, this is uh, kind of cool for two, I guess I should say, he gives six reasons why they should go on crusade. And let me just say that this was... Actually, uh, one, of, one of the reasons why uh, this was considered so compelling is that earlier in the 1080s, Urban had instituted what was called the Truce of God, where he actually got, or Urban went around and got all the major kings and princes to sign an agreement where um, they would only fight wars on like certain days and with no more than a certain number of troops and there'd be certain seasons that would be campaigning seasons and certain seasons that would not be campaigning seasons and he got everyone to agree to a rules of war, essentially, <laughs> to try to minimize the amount of casualties between European powers. Um, so this was called the Truce of God and he got people to sign this Truce of God in the 1080s. So at this point, Urban II, by the time Urban II declares the Crusade, Urban II is basically set up Rome as kind of like the UN. It's kind of like this organization, the church has kind of become this organization under Urban II where, you know, they, uh, the Pope sort of issues resolutions where he says, you know, those people are violating the church of God, uh, those people are violating the truce of God, you can go, go get the Prince of Flanders now, you know, he's, he fought on a Thursday, not allowed to fight on a Thursday, you know, things like that. So uh, this was, he was widely able to get people to agree to go on crusade because he had already had lots of diplomatic success mediating disputes among all of the European powers for the previous thing, five, six, ten years. Yes? If there was this law that you couldn't practice the faith out in public, yeah. and there was such a, yeah, obey us or die kind of thing, uh. How were they about? How were they able to get this crusade going, and with all of this agreement, without them finding out? No, or did it not matter? It wasn't. I don't see why I don't understand. 
what, 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 I don't understand the question. So I guess she's saying how the Muslim leaders not know and then come and crush it immediately, or how are the people able to oh. band together when right. they were dispersed by the Muslims already? Oh well, because I mean, because once uh, this this council and everything is happening in, in solid Christian, this is like happening in Germany, you know, northern Italy, yeah, southern far, France, far away. things okay. like that, right? You know, in order for them to in order for the Muslims to stop this, they would have had to like invade France and Germany and Italy and all of that. Um, okay. So this, he gives, finally gives six reasons, and people assign on to these six reasons because of his previous track record. Number one, he says it's a question of self-defense. Right? We've been see, we've been losing territory. We've been fighting these defend, these losing defensive wars for almost three hundred years now. You know, actually, well, more than three hundred years. Um, you know, let's go and let's try to stem this tide. Let's go and you know. Uh, Show them that you know we're willing to fight them on their territory. We'll try to stem this. Uh, we'll take. We'll, we'll go on offense for once. Self defense. Two. Christians are being oppressed in Muslim territories. These are territories that have been Christian for hundreds of years. The majority of the people living in some of, in some of these areas are still Christian, and they're not allowed to practice their faith. If they are, they'll be executed. You know they. And even if they're okay with that, they're still, you know, second-class citizens. They have to pay higher taxes, blah blah blah. You know, they're, it's it's you know not happy living conditions. Let's go. Let's go defend. Let's go liberate the oppressed Christians. Three. His third argument: If we come to the aid of the Byzantines, it's very likely that we can get an agreement to reunite the Latin and the Greek churches. At this point, the schism is still pretty young. Right? If the if the Western if the Latin Western Church is able to unite behind you know send an army there to help the Byzantines get back some of their territory, this is go actually going to make the Greek Church possibly um, urban beliefs. The Greek Church will be much more likely to come out of schism because they see that one of the reasons why the Greeks went into schism was they thought the Western Church was like really corrupt and everything. So he's going to be like, well, no, 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 we're going to try. We'll show them that we are not that corrupt. We there's been a change of leadership here. Popes of the 1100s are no longer the popes of the 800s. Okay. Fourth. They're refusing to allow pilgrimage to non-Muslims. Who are they to decide who gets to go and see the relics of the apostles in, in, the, in the Middle East? Who are they to decide who gets to make pilgrimage? That's a religious freedom violation that they're doing over there. Fourth argument. Fifth argument. We've tried to negotiate with them. Every envoy I've sent to Muslim leaders has been turned away. And we've tried to evangelize, we've tried, we've tried evangelization, you know, we, we, when we had problems with the Germans up there in Germany, we sent missionaries, you know, and the missionaries, you know, we sent St. Boniface and St. Killian up there, and, you know, they, they got the job done. We, did, we tried grassroots, you know, reaching out to them. We've tried grassroots reach, reaching out to them. We've sent missionaries. Every missionary has been killed, and whenever they do have success, all the people they convert are killed. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, for the sake, since we can't, you know, talk to these people, the only thing we can do is go and send a force there. Sixth argument he makes is, think of, like, there are so many people who were able to get their livings, their livings off the trade routes going east, right? So we need to go and like reopen up these trade routes east because there are now people who are impoverished because they are no longer able to be merchants in, in their trade. So we need to go and we need to we need to stop. We need to at least get them to agree to stop blocking these trade routes east. Six are those are the six arguments Urban makes for the first crusade. Um, I mean. Those seem like reasonable arguments. We use them today. We use them today. <laughs> if we think they're unreasonable, then. <laughs> okay. So, who responds to Urban's first crusade? Three countries respond. Well, three countries, three, three countries, I should say, respond to give troops. They all say it's a great thing. Only three of them call up troops. The Normans cough up, cough up troops. Most of the Italian states cough up troops. And the French cough up troops. And the French will actually be in charge of this first crusade. The supreme commander is going to be French. After all, they, they, they're the ones that stopped the, the Muslims in 733 at the Battle of Tours. Okay. 
And the funny thing is, is that the, these, the, only the three powers that coughed up troops were the three countries who were currently fighting wars against the Muslims anyway. So, we're already fighting wars against the Muslims, we might as well do it with papal approval now. <laughs> right, so, it's, it's like the, it's like the uh, we have the same problem with NATO today, right? It's like, okay, we're going to go and we're going to make Afghanistan a better place. We're all with you. Okay, well, who's going to come? Yeah. Well, uh, you guys have the most troops. Oh, come on. It's okay, well, the Dutch will give you 200 guys, and the Portuguese will give you another 50. And the okay, fine. Okay. So, why do these countries... So, what, so, what, so then what are... So, if that's what the... So, those countries sign up. So, why do soldiers and commanders feel, you know, decide to go on crusade? What were some of their motivations? Because remember, I mean, everyone knows Robin Hood, right? Everyone knows the story of Robin Hood, right? Good King Richard was, like, willing to, you know, give up his kingdom to his corrupt brother John to go off and fight the heroic crusades, right? I mean, everyone knows that story, right? Okay, so, um, basically three reasons. One, Pope Urban at the Council of Claremont, he encourages all the kings and princes who are going to go on crusade that anybody who volunteers to go on crusade... Yes, they should go on crusade um, out of their sincere desire to help the oppressed and everything. But um, since a lot of you guys really like serfs and you don't want, you know, to, you know, um, maybe, you know, give up your serfs who may want, well, you know, you don't want to. So here's what we'll do. Well, um, I'll offer that. So Urban, Urban says anyone who's a serf, who's not like a noble knight class, gentry class person, if any of them sign up to go on crusades, the Pope will write them a get out of serfdom free card. So you're no longer a serf if you sign up to go on the Crusades. So lots of people flock to go on the Crusades because they don't want to be serfs in France anymore. Right? So they'll take up their swords and they'll say, oh, we're going on a crusade. Okay, so uh, this is, do you think that, think that was a popular move? Yeah, yeah pretty popular move, right? Grassroots people love Urban II in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 1100s. We're no longer serfs. We're no longer bound to this land anymore. We no longer have to work for our feudal lord if we don't want to. We'll go on crusades. Okay, so this sort of had the same effect. This, people look at this the same way people look at the GI Bill today, right? If I serve in the military, I can go to college free. If I serve, if I go on crusades, then I don't be a serf anymore. I can be a freeman living in a town now. Yay. Second. Lots of people went on crusades because they wanted land and riches. If we had... So, okay, so let me get it straight, Pope Urban II. You want us to go and attack um, several Muslim countries. And these Muslim countries um, have conquered the wealth of the Byzantine Empire. And if we conquer these towns we could possibly be able to abscond with the riches of the Orient. Okay. Right. okay. right. So, uh, if we, so if we go, if we go, we conquer them. Well, we'll get, we we'll, might get paid very, very well. We conquer territory. Yay! So, lots of people sign up for the Crusades because they're adventurers and they want landed riches. Yes. Can I ask a question? How do sure. you get the word to the serfs that they could do this? Those, well, do those princes take the word back to them. Um. Combination of things. One, Pope Urban II says, you know, instructs all the clerk, all the bishops to like, you know, um, tell everyone, you know, through their churches, you know, anyone who signs up to go on the Crusades, you get to get a free, you get a certain free card. Um, and then also, also there were several princes that had committed to go on the Crusades, and he's like, well, you know, the Muslims have much bigger armies than you do, right? If you want to survive, you may want to, you know, let the serfs, you know, have some arms. You may want to train them a little bit. Yeah. So he sort of. Again, Urban was considered a master diplomat by the ten, by the late 10, 11, and 1100s, right? Uh, he, 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 had, he, had, he was pretty good at this. Okay, third thing, right? There are people who go because they have a sincere desire, because they're outraged by Muslims conquering Christian lands and refusing to go on pilgrimage, right? And a lot of people, so a lot of people who say the Crusades were bad and make this argument that Pope Urban II gives them a blessing saying, the blessing he gives them, anyone who goes on crusades, you know, if you die, if you die in the crusades, you know, you'll be saved and things like this. People make lots of hay out of this. Um, if you look at the actual blessing that Pope Urban II gives, 
the blessing that he gives is, if you're going on crusades, because you are willing to sacrifice yourself to help others, then you will be saved. Which is... Big caveat. Yeah, big caveat. If you're going on crusade, yeah, like so, he gives them all a blessing before all the crusaders leave. He's like, gives them a blessing. In the blessing, he says, you know, for all of you who are going out, you know, out of your sincere desire to help, if you're, if you're dying for the welfare of others, then God will surely save you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So... That doesn't include looting and... Uh, yeah, you know, he, 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 yeah, but Pope Urban II does not give a blanket carte blanche for the Crusaders to do whatever they want, which is oftentimes what people say about the Crusades. Well, Pope Urban II, people flock to the Crusades because Pope Urban II said, if you go on the Crusades, you're automatically saved. No, he said, if you go on the Crusades and you die for the sake of, for the sake of protecting others, like, you will surely be saved. God will surely save you. Mm -hmm. Right. Not the same thing as go on the Crusades. By going on the Crusades, you will, you know, God will bless you. He, do, he, does, however, he does, however, grant an indulgence to everybody who goes on the Crusade for this reason, for the sake of protecting others and survives. So if you go on the Crusade and you don't die, and you did it for the sincere desire of protecting others, you are granted an indulgence. Okay. I guess that's opens up a whole other thing on like what, what people say indulgences are, but mm -hmm. that, that, that's an indulgence. You're granted an indulgence if you go on crusade for the, and you protect others. Um, okay, so there were three crusades then that were sanctioned by, by, by the church. So there are, three there are three crusades that meet this definition. Number one, the first crusade, which was Urban II's crusade. This one was the most successful of the crusades. They recaptured Nicaea, where the Council of Nicaea was held. They recaptured Jerusalem and Antioch. They then set up a kingdom, a Christian kingdom, that sort of encompasses modern-day Syria and uh, Palestine, what's now Israel as well. But then shortly after they do this, political divisions uh, surface between the Crusaders. And then you've got like the Normans and the Italians and the French, and they want to carve up this territory in different ways, and they want to have their own guys administering it, and things like this. So what the Pope does is to push this aside, Urban II authorizes crusading religious orders, thinking that they think that crusading religious orders will actually bring more stability and peace to this region, because you'll have religious orders who will be priests and monks who are trained in martial combat, and what they will do is they'll have these monasteries over there, and they'll like rapid deploy if anything bad happens, and we'll put these guys in charge of the defense rather than these people who are underneath these princes and kings from Europe who may want to exploit this stuff. So if, if, I'd be happy to talk about more crusading, or, crusading orders and more in depth about those in the question and answer if you'd like. But Pope sets up crusading orders to defend the territory because he thinks that will actually be better than having troops from the, from the, from the Duke of Normandy, troops from uh, the King of France and troops from you know various states of Italy. So um, Second Crusade. So that's what happens. That's the First Crusade. Second Crusade happens in 1147. So the first one is Urban's Crusade in the 1090s. I think this one ends around 1099. The Second Crusade, which occurred with papal sanction, was the Crusade. Second Crusade occurred in 1147. And basically what happened here was uh, Saladin was able, Saladin, the famous uh, Ar um, Arabic general, Arab general, was able to unite several of the Arab leaders and go and take back the Holy Land. And uh, so the second, so, er, so the, the Pope in 1147 then authorizes another crusade to go and try to relieve what has been reconquered by the Muslims. And they're, on, they're not able to do this, but there's a truce affected, and they're able to go home. The third crusade, which was King Richard's crusade. So uh, Richard of England was in charge of the third crusade. Um, this occurred from 1189 through 1192, and it is Whoa. a neat one. The long crusade. Yes. Um, well, 89 to 92, that's three, 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 years. Years. three years. So he goes, so he goes on crusade, and uh, they're 
he has a very successful series of battles where like he Richard is able to defeat Muslim armies in pitched battles in the field, but he's not able to successfully siege any of the cities. So as a result, uh, Richard is unable to take back any of the major cities. And uh, so it's a near success. He defeats them in battle, but he's not able to take any cities, and he evokes a truce with Saladin, and the Crusaders go home. And that was the last, uh, that was the last officially approved crusade. Um, the, uh, there were crusades after this, but these were crusades that were declared for political reasons by various kings of Europe, because after the seeming success of the popes in the first three crusades, kings of Europe found it politically popular to declare a crusade on themselves, and then rally people to them, and then go on crusade. Um, but, so these were the only three crusades that occurred with papal approval or in church council. Um, there was a fourth crusade that happened in 1204 that was initially approved by the church, but then the crusaders, uh, the crusading the general, the crusading military commanders decided they would sack Constantinople instead. Um, and that's actually that is actually when like the Greeks were like, no, no, no. At this point, even if you go on crusade, we're not going to reunite with you. Um, so in 1204, the pope then. <coughs> The Pope then revokes his official approval that he gave them when they left Rome, and the uh, the crusading generals say, that's okay, we'll continue on anyway. <laughs> and they lost. So, uh, let's see. So that's, uh, that, that's okay. So that's basically the history of the legitimate crusades. Um, there, were four, there were basically four good aspects that I'd point out here on the whole between the three crusades um, that historians sort of agree on. One is that uh, commerce... Commerce increased throughout Europe as a result of the Crusades, mostly because so many people were freed from serfdom as a result of the Crusades that you know how you know how you know how uh, towns crop up because you had people who were now you had lots of freemen who were like were going to farm the same land they had when they were serfs, so they went and formed so towns started to spring up all over Europe as a result of the Crusades because so many were brought out of serfdom. Second, there was an intellectual revival um, after the Crusades. Um, because uh, when the Crusaders, when the first Crusade was successful, um, they, recon they had conquered and reconquered. So they had conquered new libraries from the Muslims, and also they had reconquered old Christian libraries from the Muslims. Um, and as a result, uh, the teachings of Aristotle had actually been lost to most of Europe when the Muslims conquered these areas, because the biggest libraries in Christendom were all in these eastern areas that had been conquered by the Muslims. So when, so, when Christians were reconquering Spain, and when they were from the Reconquista, and also when they're reconquering Jerusalem, they now have access to Aristotelian writings. And as a result of the Crusaders bringing Aristotle back, um, that sort of led to Thomism and Thomas Aquinas. You know, often talked about you know how technologically advanced Egypt was. Yes, in Egypt. Yeah. Is it possible during this? Muslim conquering that that data that, that was in those libraries was lost and therefore we had to go back and refine it. Um, you could argue that to a certain extent. I mean, the the the, the issue was that um, one of the reasons why Egypt, for example, was so advanced is that it had one of the largest libraries in all of in all of the Roman Empire, yeah. um, the Great Library of Alexandria, um, and then so there were as many libraries that had as much stuff in them in, in Europe during the Roman Empire period, because most of it was in the, the Greek East. Uh, so then when the Muslims conquered these areas, there's no longer a way of disseminating this information back, back west, except for there were maybe a few monasteries that had writings of Aristotle, um, but it wasn't widely disseminated. The Crusaders then reconquered these areas, they then bring back a lot of the books, um, and Aristotle becomes widely disseminated um, af as after the Crusades, especially after the First Crusade. Um, third, um, papal office was widely able to constrain the violence between competing kingdoms of Europe. Um, so as a result, there was sort of a system of checks and balances set up as a result of the truce of God, because now you had the church, all of the, because people had signed up to the truce of God and signed up to the Council of Claremont, that means that in practice, almost all of the European countries had officially agreed that, like, the Pope was the arbiter of international disputes throughout Europe, um, which means that, like, they officially acknowledged the Pope's ability and the clergy's ability to 
give ecclesiastical sanction to them engaging in war, um, and which is sort of an implicit check on the power of the state. So um, all throughout the Middle Ages, um, this has been going to be a, a check. That, so, that over there, there, so basically, after the Council of Clermont until the Reformation, there are almost no absolute monarchies in Europe, because you sort of have a situation where you've got the church and the state, and they're kind of like, the church is like checking the power of the kings. So some people say that's an accomplishment. Um, the fourth thing is that this actually, after the Crusades happened, after these first three Crusades, this actually slowed the rate of Muslim advance because now Muslims were afraid that at any time the Christians could come back. So they were now less willing to engage in prolonged periods of conquest. The, prolonged, the periods of conquest, there were very few armies of occupation by Muslims. When Muslims fought Christians after the first three Crusades, there were predominantly raiding parties. Every once in a while, there would be an attempt to conquer a major city. But after the first three Crusades, Muslims are sort of hunkered down into defensive format, and they're sort of a much more grad. If they take territory, it's much more gradual, as opposed to conquested raids or conquered raids the city. So the rate of uh, Muslim expansion slows because Muslims are afraid that they spread themselves. Muslim rulers are afraid that they spread themselves too thin then at any point, there could be a Christian invasion of Jerusalem again, and we don't want that. So, uh, that is... So, if we're doing apologetics on the Crusades, what, were some, what are some of the things we want to make sure to point out? Someone, someone, if someone says, Oh, come on! The Crusades! What would, what, would, what would be some things that we'd want to point out if someone is criticizing the Church based on the Crusades? The humanitarian mission. Okay, that every... That, Almost everybody at the time considered this to be a massive humanitarian mission. Yes? There were only three that were approved by the uh, peoples. Okay, they're, good. There were only three that actually were approved by the church. The first three. What they were in response uh -huh. to a, um, an oppressive occupation. Yeah, you could argue that like the Crusades were defensive. Right? They're, they're going on going on, so the best defense is a good offense, right? They're going on offense in response to the massive conquest of territory that they had sort of been reacting to and fighting defensive wars for for several hundred years. And those here, right? It's only like, you know, one century where they actually go on offense. To, but when they go on offense, it's mostly to stem the tide of something they feel is an offensive threat. Yeah. It's, really, it's really a defense against religious persecution. Yeah, you could also argue that. Like, look, the Crusades are, I mean, one of the primary motivations were <laughs> trying to stop people from being persecuted by religion. That benevolent, you know? benevolent occupier thing uh -huh. was a fallacy. Yeah, the benevolent occupier thing is definitely a fallacy. They only were, maybe you could argue that those conditions, you could, you could say, fine, maybe those conditions were in the status of that time period benevolent, but they only applied those if you survive and surrendered your forces. Right, so it's, it's deceptive to argue that Muslims are, are were benevolent occupiers. Yeah? In urban six justifications, which are still justifications we use today. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the justifications that urban second use, there's still justifications that every major country that goes on, you know, has armed conflict uses today. I mean, it's not anything that's, uh, you know, particularly... It's not something you can sort of sit here and be like, oh man, those people in the 1100s were so stupid and like, you know, uh, you know, led by their religious passions to declare this war. You know, it's not that we still use those reasons today. Well, yeah. I'll... I was going to expand on the defense theme. Sure. The Ten Commandments that says, don't kill unless you're defending your life. Uh -huh. And so you're allowed to defend your own life. Okay. So it's a defensive posture. Okay, good. It's, you know, it's a defensive posture. It's, you know, and, and uh, you know, def there's nothing wrong with defending yourself or protecting somebody else. And there wasn't forcible conversion. Yeah, yeah, there was no, absolutely no attempt to forcefully convert Muslims during either of these major states. Possibly there may have been isolated. There may have been isolated incidents, but those isolated, those isolated incidents were not part of the papal mandate. Mm -hmm. And there may have been crusades that were not officially sanctioned by the church to try to do that, but then those are illegal crusades. There are crusades that are not Crusades, according to the church. Um, when St. Francis went uh, to talk to mm -hmm. the, the Muslims, what period of time was that? Uh, that let's was see, St. Francis. 
Yeah, I'm trying to think. St. Francis, I want to say that was, I want to, that may have been before the Fourth Crusade. So what, St. Francis would have been alive in the 11, 1200s? Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. I can't remember. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so forgetting the dates of St. Francis. In the 1200s, the 1200s, really 1200s. Yeah, so that would have been, that would have been either around the time of the Third Crusade, or it would have been between the Third and the aborted Fourth Crusade. Because he does talk to Saladin. Yes. And okay. Saladin so he's talking to Saladin. This is either going to be directly before the Third Crusade or uh, or directly after the Third Crusade. Yeah. So I mean, Saladin. Things are. I'm trying to think. Saladin. Saladin, I think, was uh, was a. I'm pretty sure he fought in the Second Crusade. Saladin. Saladin would have been a young guy in the in the Second Crusade. He would have been an older guy in the Third Crusade. 